Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 587 of the podcast and is Tuesday the 16th of November 2021 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to Denise Baden about writing for the environment and we discuss whether stories can in fact save the world. The relentless news about climate change can leave us despondent, but what if we can use fiction to help people with ideas of what the future could look like and the actions we can take to change things? I've experienced this myself recently when I read Kim Stanley Robinson's book, The Ministry for the Future, which helped me see what could be done rather than focusing on bad news all the time, which we've had (laughs) in recent weeks with the COP26 conference. Denise has a mission to use fiction to help the environment and Orna Ross from the Alliance of Independent Authors is now sponsoring the Green Stories Prize, which Denise explains and I have an audio clip from Orna as well explaining why she wanted to get involved. So I hope you enjoy this extra episode on what is such an important topic and I hope you'll consider entering one of the green prizes, the novel or the short story or there's lots on the website for options. And we also talk towards the end about how ecologically friendly is publishing anyway. And that has some very interesting things. So I hope you enjoy the interview. Denise Baden is the Professor of Sustainable Business at the University of Southampton in the UK. She's also a screenwriter and novelist and founded the series of Green Stories Writing Competitions. So welcome, Denise. Hello, nice to be here. Oh, great to talk to you about this topic. So tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and also sustainability and environmental issues. Okay, uh, well, I've had a bit of a, a butterfly background. I actually worked as a sales rep for publishers many years ago, but I couldn't do that once I became a mum. So I went back to university and I did a bit of psychology and and then I was harassing them on their, their green policies, not having a recycling bin. So when the person teaching business ethics, which is one of the things we're also doing, uh, left, I got put in charge of that. And then I ended up doing stuff on sustainability. So that's my sort of academic career. And that's why I've done articles on that. Um, but I think I was inspired to be a greenie by, by a fictional book myself, which is why I'm quite interested in writing fiction. So I read Stark. It must have been back in the early 90s by Ben Elton. Oh, me too. I remember that one. <laughs> I know. I'm not sure if it still stands the test of time, but I thought it was brilliant at the time. It was really fun. And right in the middle of this sort of love story, epic adventure, he says something like, Dave was a water birth. And but he died soon after being born. And it turns out that Dave is a dolphin that got caught up in a tuna net. And I thought, hang on a minute, I can buy dolphin friendly tuna. And I never would have chosen to have read a sort of a green themed book. You know, I, I, I read for fun. But that really made me think. And I think it gave me the idea that well, it awakened my green conscience. I realised what we're doing without really realising it. It had loads of examples like that. And it gave me the idea that perhaps I might like to write fiction and perhaps smuggle green issues in myself. I love that. And I think it's so important what you said. We read for fun. And if people haven't read Ben Elton, his books are funny. Well, most of them. He's got a few. (laughs) His more recent ones are less funny, but his earlier ones are are really funny. And and you're right. It's reading for fun. We read for escape. And the news is, let's face it, full of pretty dire stuff. And people feel anxiety around the environment and just feel like it's too big. So obviously you did psychology as well, which is great. Why are stories a good way to, like you said, smuggle these ideas in? Well, I I think, you know, everyone turns to sort of science as a way to address the climate crisis. But I think it's stories that engage our imaginations. 
it's stories that enable us to see things from other points of view. And especially things like sci-fi and one set in the future, they also say how things could be. And I think it's a real shame that actually a lot of stories set in the future are sort of dystopian because we think, oh, I, you know, I don't want to go there. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had some stories set in the future that, that were utopian, that gave us a positive vision we could aspire to, perhaps? So I, I love stories. And I also think, because I teach in the area of sustainability, you're always talking to the same people. So you're teaching those who've chosen to take that course and people who are putting the word out about climate crisis and so on. They're only reaching those who are choosing to watch that. So we're kind of preaching to the converted all the time. So I quite like the idea of using fiction to engage a wider audience and also perhaps focus a little bit more on what we can do rather than just on what's wrong if you know what I mean Mm. well it's interesting I I recently read well in fact I'm still reading because it's it's got many levels there's the ministry for the future by Kim Stanley Robinson have you read that one I have yes it's an epic book it is it is it's epic it's massive exactly (laughs) but I feel like that book has made a big impact on me I feel like I was kind of halfway there on many of these things but it is actually what he talks about for example with his carbon credit system yes the way he talks about it in the future I actually and I've been getting into the sort of crypto currency yes, side I of know. things yeah I've been <laughs> trying digital. to follow you <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because reading his book I suddenly understood how a carbon credit economy could emerge that yes. actually made sense and what's so brilliant about his writing is obviously uh, delved down into the research but then turned it into a story and it's like like you said it's not the facts and figures that actually engage us we actually couldn't care that million or like what the 1.5 degree like that people don't know what that means but like at the beginning of the ministry of the future if you have this heat wave and you describe it that just makes a lot more of an impact doesn't it so it's taking those facts and figures and turning them into characters and stories It's a great example because he does, he sort of imagines there is a ministry for the future and what it might do. And he gets glaciologists on it, economists, sociologists, scientists, and they're all working together. And at heart, it's it's actually quite optimistic. You know, there are tragedies in it, but overall, we kind of crack it. The the only issue I had, and actually, Joanne, I'm so glad you brought it up because I consider you, you know, the expert on this, is one of his solutions is based on blockchain technology as a way to leverage finance towards low carbon uh, solutions. But my understanding of cryptocurrency is it's about a thousand times more energy intensive than normal currency. Now, I understand that's being dealt with, but simply switching to a renewable energy supplier for that won't really crack it because we've got a supply issue as well as a demand issue with renewable energy. Do do you have a view on that? Well, as you said, I mean, and I recently shared uh, on on the show, there are carbon negative blockchains at this point, which I think is absolutely fascinating. I I can't speak to the technology on it. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is many of the people involved in cryptocurrency and digital currencies are younger people who absolutely want to save the planet and yeah. so a lot of people putting I, I mean I think about it now as, and also you know I'm into the AI side what yeah. I think is that some of the smartest people on the planet are now thinking about this and are, and do care about this and mm-hmm. so that's why reading someone like Kim Stanley Robinson is good because he obviously is a very smart dude who's yes. done a lot of research but then turned it into story so yeah. and I I always think with the cryptocurrency and blockchain and all this stuff you don't necessarily need to know how it works technically to think that it might be a way of doing things differently in the future. And that's what we've got to think, isn't it? We've got to do things differently and yes. try and make decisions in, in that way. But just coming back to, to stories in particular. So your novel, tell us about your novel, Habitat Man. You call it eco-fiction as well as romantic <laughs> comedy. So tell us about the book and also what is eco-fiction anyway? Well, eco-fiction typically is quite doom-laden, most of it. I don't think it has to be, but it typically is. So it often sort of imagines that some terrible things have happened. You know, we've messed up our planet and now we live in this sort of post-apocalyptic world with, with no bees or nature. And so 
it's quite alarmist. I wouldn't like to read it. I'm afraid I'm very frivolous when it comes to my reading matter. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, not all of them are like that. So some of them just have very strong nature themes. Like I think that The Call of the Wild is a sort of classic by, by Jack London, perhaps. And I think Flight Behaviour by Barbara Kingsolver is sort of about butterflies and climate change and the, the human drama at the centre of it. But most of it is quite dystopian, I would say. I call mine eco-fiction, um, I guess because the aim of it is to try and share green solutions via fiction. But it's, it's, so the book is really inspired by a, a real-life ecologist who gave up his, you know, he retired and he set up this green garden consultancy and you pay £10 to the local transition network and he'll come around and advise you on how to make your garden wildlife friendly. And he gave me so many wonderful tips and I just really wanted to share them with a wider group of people. And I also thought, what a lovely premise for a story because he can visit all kinds of back gardens and, you know, his first client, he falls in love. Uh, he digs up a body. He creates habitats for the Wizard of Wollstone for bats and frogs and Dawn the, the polyamorist who wants hedgehogs. So there's a lovely opportunity to meet a variety of characters. And very naturally, through the, the, the process of the stories or smuggling green solutions because they're all in my head I research it and it's it's quite frustrating when you get an article out and maybe three maybe four people might read it and they'll misquote <laughs> it <laughs> yeah so I've already know that I've affected people and people have said oh I didn't know this I didn't know that and so on so for example I happen to know that we're very worried ecologists are very worried about our barren soil and the lack of life for microorganisms in the soil and you know is it pesticides is it slug pellets well one of the things it seems to be is pet treatments like fleas treatments and wormers now not many people know that but that's something can my heroin has a dog <laughs> I can easily put that in and suggest less toxic alternatives or, or so on so it's a way, and people didn't know that. They sort of said, oh, I didn't know this. You know, <laughs> I, I found it in your book. But they would never have chosen to watch a documentary on flea treatment or, you know, uh, on, a, on yeah. soil, you know. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I agree that so many of these books are dystopian. Either we've destroyed everything or it's like nature has come nature has come back and nature yes. is now almost um taken over like i read eden by tim lebon yeah. recently which is a, a horror eco thriller and yeah. they have to go into the sort of the wild nature where things have been transformed by radiation and all this and it's really cool but it's like yeah, yeah don't really want to live in that but it's interesting you mentioned some of these simple things i mean i'm just starting to consider other genres so uh, writing in the travel genre for example yes. and i'm i guess i'm talking about walking mm -hmm. which you know walking train travel changing ways of you know yeah. slow slow travel there, there are angles that we can tackle aren't there in in pretty yes. much any genre I guess I mean yes I mean simply just choosing to show someone who's taken a green alternative and you don't even have to play the green card there's all kinds of reasons to want to go by train or by bike or I've got a couple of friends who tandem <laughs> from you know right from Scotland down to Cornwall on on their bike I mean there's lovely stories to tell there you don't have to say oh they did it for the climate you can just have people thinking well that might be a nice way to do it and have an adventure but I, I do often think when you come across say a vegan character or a green character in a book or a film quite often they're really preachy and annoying and it's like I think simply just showing these characters as being maybe nice <laughs> you know would help Yes, I think that's important. And we all a bit tired of the kind of preachy and the 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 um some of the more aggressive forms, I guess, of, of green activism. Some people will say that is entirely necessary, but again, there are different layers, as you've talked about, different layers of how people want to change their lifestyle. Yes. And that's actually super important. I mean, even in my book, Tree of Life, I did a lot of research on trees, surprisingly, <laughs> and I ended up donating money to the tree council for tree planting, that kind yeah. of thing, because, Brilliant. yeah, because of what I discovered. Now, in the book, in the author's note, I've put 
you know, this is what I discovered from the tree council and part yeah. of this is donated to it. Now, hopefully no one has read that book and thought I was preaching about trees. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it has to stand on its own terms. And I, I think you're right. There's something a little bit toxic at times in the way climate change is portrayed. It's like people are saying, don't live on this planet. You know, the planet would be better off if you weren't here. And I, that's not nice. <laughs> Mm. You know, yes, we could walk more lightly on this beautiful earth, but saying that some of it is quite anti-human and that that's not a nice thing for, for people to, to be reading. And, and I also think how you pitch it depends on where you are. So maybe in some countries, there's still quite a lack of awareness in certain segments of the population about climate change. But I think in the UK now people are aware. I mean, I'm hearing... Um, surveys like the majority of young people think humanity is doomed or wake up in the night with nightmares and eco-anxiety so when you've got that Mm. (laughs) if you continue just to raise the alarm all you're going to do is create eco-anxiety and perhaps alarm fatigue whereas if you kind of tie it to solutions or suggest some positive visions of what it might look like if we did it right then I think you're taking that energy and putting it somewhere constructive. Mm. So let's just talk about, so how would we do this? I mean, for example, it's such a big thing that I I would suggest people pick one thing that they particularly care about. So for example, I do care about walking Mm -hmm. and slow travel like for example I would really like us to be able to get trains much more cheaply than fly in in the UK and in Europe so I could take that one thing slow travel and turn that into a story where a character does some slow travel and weave ideas in there so uh, how would you suggest people people do that so perhaps would this be a good time, Jonas, to talk about the Green Stories competition? Yeah, absolutely. Tell us about that. Yes, <laughs> uh, because it ties quite nicely into that. So three years ago, I, I was quite frustrated, I guess, that everything was problem focused in the whole green discourse and climate change debate. Um very little was solution focused. Everything was raising the alarm. Everything also was preaching to the converted. So I set up this series of green stories competitions um, and they're they're free to enter. And the criteria was that writers um, had to either, well, first and foremost, write an engaging story or no one's going to read it. And then either kind of aim it at the mainstream and perhaps smuggle green solutions into the, the plot and the narrative or kind of develop a positive vision of what a sustainable society might look like. And I put on the website all kinds of different solutions. So so people always tend to do the same ones over and over, like recycling or planting trees. But actually, there's some quite systemic things that I think we could change in society. I mean, you, you touched on it a little bit earlier if we started accounting for carbon for example perhaps we all instead of money we had a carbon credit card or a personal carbon allowance or perhaps instead of shops we had libraries or sort of libraries of things so just things that might be quite systemic if you're world building but if you're not you know you can just sort of plug stuff in probably like habitat man does Uh, like I've got water butts in there I've got green funerals I've got green fashion (laughs) avoiding pesticides all kinds of things just naturally in the plot so we've had 12 competitions um, and the first one was a short story one and we had an anthology out from that and now we've got one coming up which Orna Ross who I know is well known to to you and probably your listeners Mm. uh, who set up the Alliance of Independent Authors she sponsored us now for a novel competition every year and that's coming up at the deadline is 30th of December and we've got short story competitions coming up um, in the new year so the idea is that you kind of try and tie these issues to actual solutions readers can engage with and um, we get quite a few entries but I have to say Joanna most of them have not met the criteria 
which is mm. one of the reasons I ended up writing Habitat Man. I thought I need to show them what it looks like. So, for example, we probably had 20 entries about rainforest destruction, where our hero or heroine goes off and becomes an, an eco-warrior in Indonesia, tackling evil tree, tree cutters. But your average reader isn't going to up sticks and, and head off to Indonesia. <laughs> mm. um, but none of them mentioned solutions. So, for example, solutions might be, well, a lot of the trees are being um, cleared for beef crops. So perhaps giving up beef is a solution or look where your wood comes from. So if you're writing a crime thriller and there's a body, perhaps it isn't buried in a mahogany coffin. <laughs> perhaps it's buried in a willow coffin, a local willow coffin that, that will be really good for the environment. So my book has a, has a body. <laughs> and it's buried in a, in, a, in a willow coffin so I try and steer them towards the solutions and, and whenever I do workshops I do them quite regularly I did one just yesterday actually with some 14 year olds and they come up with lovely ideas for stories but when I said okay now tie you know what actions do you want your reader to take or not take as a result of reading this a lot of them realized they'd only then raised the issue they hadn't actually created a story that enabled them to show solutions mm. and I think it's hard because a lot of fiction we like drama don't we we like conflict so writing a world where everything's lovely doesn't really lend itself but I, I had a lovely entry the, the other day of a detective one where it was in sort of utopian society but there's lots of issues going on there was a sort of dope doping scandal in sports there was something else but the detective then can go everywhere and explore this society <laughs> and there's another one where something weird happened and people got sick every time they did anything eco-unfriendly <laughs> it was a really <laughs> wonderful device and then it had a wonderful ideas such as the rich people paying other people to to get sick so to sort of clean their house <laughs> or drive their car <laughs> um so there's been wonderful devices there and ideas um, mm. So you, so let's um, just be clear on the uh, what you have to do for it, because obviously this is going out in November, and the end of the award for 2021 is the end of December. So if it's a novel award, do they have to write a whole novel, or what do you have to submit for the competition? Okay, so well, bearing in mind that we're going to run this every year now, so if mm. it's not ready for this year, maybe next year. But we ask for three chapters. The first chapter. Uh, a chapter that most demonstrates your green criteria and another chapter, preferably the final one. We don't require it to be complete, but we would expect it perhaps to be almost 50 percent complete because the idea is then that we take the winners and we mentor them towards publication. And this is why having Orna on board is so great, because she has that knowledge of the self-publishing world. So, yeah, I'd say we'd want it sort of first draft half complete at least. Mm. Um, and, yeah so what's the website for that so people know it, so it's www.greenstories.org.uk and is it just for UK writers no it's open to anybody as long as it's in English and it's not yet published we've had entrants from Australia from Canada from America from all over and there's also the short story competition so the deadline for adult entrance is, I think, 21st of February. And we got an under 18 one, which is 3rd of March. And that's up to 5,000 words. So I'm just cutting into the interview here to share a short audio clip from Orna Ross on why she's sponsoring the prize. Many of you will know Orna from the Alliance of Independent Authors. And of course, we do a monthly advanced podcast discussion on the Ask Ally podcast together. So here's a short statement from Orna, and then we'll get back into the interview with Denise. When Denise invited me to become the sponsor of the Green Stories novel prize, I was immediately intrigued. I'm the kind of novelist myself who believes in the power of fiction to affect change, to change hearts as well as minds. And it's one of the reasons I write, one of the main reasons I write. And 
we have this huge, enormous challenge as as a species, as a people. And of course, we need the politicians and the journalists and all the good people to do what they do. But the conversation about climate change can sometimes be quite fixed and narrow. Uh, sometimes we're speaking to those who are already converted and failing to reach those who are not convinced. And um, I think story can cut through all of this. I think uh, through story, we can expand the conversation. We can expand our awareness of what's possible. And that's what I would most like this prize to do. There is a focus on solutions and there is also a mentoring dimension to the prize, both of which were very uh, significant for me. I think that's really important. And so this is more about the kind of prize that will reward imaginative expansion. Um, The book doesn't need to be completely finished. What we're looking for is the kind of talent that will both entertain, um, perhaps amuse or or through great storytelling talent, uh, sweep us away in a way that, you know, only story can. So everything is wide open here. There's no particular genre being asked for. There's room for the most dystopian science fiction at one end of the scale and the most ordinary uh, everyday story around recycling or carbon offsetting or something completely prosaic at the other end of the scale doesn't matter what the content of the story is provided it shifts our way of thinking about this issue and expands our sense of positive possibility. Fantastic. So that sounds really good. But then I I also wanted to ask you more specifically about our own industry, because, I mean, obviously we are we're writing these stories, but then we would love to uh, put them out in print and ship them all around the world or print them in different uh, jurisdictions and have it as ebooks and audiobooks. So what are some of the environmental issues around the publishing industry in particular? Okay, so I did look into this because I I really wanted to put uh, the FSC sort of label on my book, especially as it's sort of eco-themed. So that just means that the paper has got been certified by the Forest uh, Stewardship Council. And um, but none of them do that. Amazon don't do that. Ingram Sparks don't do that. So they do say that lightning source, you know, Ingram Sparks Wing expects each of its paper suppliers to be environmentally responsible and not use paper sourced from endangered old growth forests. It doesn't specifically do the FSC certification and neither does Amazon. Um, But at the same time, I think it's worth mentioning that the model of print on demand has so much less waste than the model of doing large print rounds, you know, quite often huge amounts of pulped Mm. or or sent back, which again has got transport costs. So I think print on demand has got so many advantages in terms of lack of waste that the fact it's not always on FSC certified paper is quite a minor issue, really, bearing in mind they are actually looking at the forest they've got it from. Um, and also the fact that they folk, you know, we focus very much on ebooks is good. So I, I did a little bit, and it turns out that ebooks are about twenty times more sustainable than paperbacks. Mm. So, and if you've got a renewable energy provider, it would be much more than that. Twenty times, at least, yeah. <laughs> wow. That's incredible to know. I hope everyone, <laughs> I hope everyone has heard that. I mean, that's that's brilliant. I mean, I I was thinking, oh, uh, because I know I have to charge my device or whatever. I mean, yes. the delivery cost is tiny, but we know that the storage costs of these things go down every year. And the, the people, I mean, it, it's difficult because I know some people have issues with capitalism, but actually, the, the people, the companies that are driving the costs down and trying to change the technology are often the ones trying to make more margin. Margins. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. the, the storage of and the, the making of electricity, generation of electricity and all these things 
I, I guess that's why I'm positive about the future. I am positive, you know, with recently with AI DeepMind's AlphaFold, which solved a problem humans have not been able to solve, which is protein folding. Yeah. Um, and this is going to revolutionize uh, drug design and all of this. And I'm like, well, this is a problem humans could not solve. And, yes. uh, you know, the AI has, ha, has done it. The AI tool has done it. And DeepMind specifically basically want to save the world, yep. which is awesome. And I, so I, I feel more more positive that we'll be able to solve some of these intractable problems because of technology and AI. And you've just, in a way, you've just said that with the eBooks, 20 times more sustainable. (laughs) I know, I know. I mean, a lot does depend as well. So for example, I was looking at things like, is it better to download something on Netflix or, or buy the DVD and, and so on? So it turns out if you're watching something over and over, it's best just to have it hard copy. But if it's a one-off, you're better off streaming it and keeping your camera off on talks and so on makes a big difference. And, and if you're just listening, don't have the visuals. I mean, these things you know make a difference, but... Yeah, moving away from the massive distribution of physical stuff mm. is, is generally much more eco-friendly. I would say just on that uh, on the CD thing, I mean, surely that any of those will go into a landfill and never, ever biodegrade. So surely streaming is always going to be better when it comes to the long run because you don't have anything in a landfill. Yes, I, I guess if you have a load of sort of CDs or, or DVDs and you already have them it's much better to watch them rather than stream something but if you're buying from new then yes it's I say in most cases it's better to stream and especially if you've got a renewable energy provider your conscience is going to be much more clear on that as well. Mm. Well I think this is this is a way that I think we want to frame it is instead of looking at the news and feeling miserable and depressed about the world ending <laughs> Look at the news and do some research into things and turn that into a story that then gives you and other people hope for a change in society. And and that to me seems like maybe use these things as clues as opposed to news. (laughs) I mean, certainly speaking from my own experience, writing Habitat Man has been pure therapy because, you know, when you're sort of working in the area of climate change and the biodiversity crisis it is it is quite a frightening world but being able to construct my own story and basically move my characters around and have that complete control and sort of scatter little green solutions sort of throughout the plot and it made me feel that I was contributing something positive and making people smile at the same time and it, it certainly kept me sane during lockdown <laughs> Yeah, I imagine. And do you include, like, I always include an author's note about my research, about my thoughts, that kind of thing. Do you include an author's note about the sort of the research behind it? Well, I've got my website. And so I I do say when things have sort of influenced it. So for example, one of the things I talk about is turning your back garden into a meadow. And I've done lots of experiments. So I let one half of my lawn just grow wild and the other half I got a meadow mat. And then I found out most meadow mats or wildflower turf are backed with plastic. And I thought, well, that's not good. And they say it breaks down, but it doesn't. I consulted my my friendly ecologist. It just breaks down into microplastics, (laughs) which is even worse. So I scouted around to try and find one that didn't have a plastic back and one promised they didn't delivered it and it did so I put a blog out about that um, on my website and that made it into the book and um, and then I found out that composting toilets were supposed to be very good for the environment so I got my own completely fell in love with it Uh, (laughs) great great for barbecues when you know people don't be tramping in inside the house I've I've got it in my back shed so I've got a lovely chapter on that and so everything I've kind of done I've done a little sort of post or or whatever um I could do more there's no doubt about it I have tried I have probably kept my research quite separate from what I write fictionally and you have given me the idea that perhaps there is room to tie it a, a little bit more together perhaps do a few more blogs about some of the science behind some of the things that sort of are casually referred to 
in, in, mm. in the book. But I said I didn't want to bore people in the book with too much information. So I, I kept that quite light. Well, that's why I use an author's note, which goes mm. in at, in the end, at the end, after the book is finished. Yeah. And so and I always include research there. And as a reader, I love author's notes in fiction and I always look for them and want them to be there uh, because I read a lot of the types of thrillers I read are based on scientific stuff or oh, interesting okay. historical research research or uh, any of this type of stuff so um, certainly and I always include a bibliography at the back of my novels as well so things that I've read that have influenced the story and like it doesn't again it doesn't have to be preachy but I think Mm. I think an author's note or even you say you create a landing page on your website and then you just say at the back just in the middle of your back page um, if you'd like to read about the science behind this come over to this page and then at least people who've read the book are directed to find out more that's a good idea Joanna I think I probably might do that a a friend of mine did suggest perhaps doing a podcast where I mix up readings from the book with a little bit of chat about the the story behind it but it's just just, I mean you know yourself it's a lot of work (laughs) it's a question of time so I've got a sequel I'm dying to get on with (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Well, and I think obviously you're pitching people like me to come on podcasts and that, that mm. is a, a good way forward as well to talk about this topic because I do, and you're, I'm really glad you're doing this. I feel like it's something I kind of want to talk about, but I also know how how a lot of people just turn off. So I hope <laughs> that people still listening can, <laughs> um, can uh, save the planet whilst also writing good stories. <laughs> Well, Habitat Man is is good fun. My my favourite review was from s- someone I, I bumped to while walking my dogs in the park, and they said, "Oh, you you did Habitat Man," and they said they read it with a smile on their face all the way through, and that that was lovely. And it's like, please put that on Amazon. They never did, but it was still lovely to hear. <laughs> Absolutely right. So where can people find you and your books and everything you do online? Okay, well, my website is dabaden.com. So that's D-A-B-A-D-E-N.com. And that's got a bit about me, um, a bit about Habitat Man. I've got links to my Green Stories website there as well. And there's a link to where you can buy my book. At the moment, it's available on Amazon, ebook, paperback. I've got an audiobook narrator you know, as we speak, working on the audio book version, because I, I did a book launch the other day and it was so delightful to hear other people read sections. I just said, come along and read the bit you like best. <laughs> and it was so lovely. It came alive in other people's voices. So I've got to do an audio book. So that hopefully will be ready by the end of the year and on request from from bookshops. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Denise. That was great. Okay, well, thank you. You give me plenty to think about. (laughs) (laughs) So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Denise today and the comments from Orna and that you're more encouraged to see a way to get involved with green stories or just to write some eco-fiction of your own and focus on the positive ways of changing the world for the environment with your fiction. So on Monday, I'm talking to Alan Baxter about how short stories can be the basis to an award-winning long-term author career. Now, Alan and I have been online friends for a decade now, and it's always good to talk to him. And I find his career encouraging, and he just keeps winning awards, which I know many of us would like to do. So it's interesting to talk to him about that and also what he focuses on in his career. So happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.